Hey, how is everybody doing out there in podcast land? This is Severin Henderson again with another episode of Department 3C Presents, a podcast. Today I'm here with one of my good friends. I know I say that every episode, but that's what I use. That's what that's what I have to go on so far is having my good friends come on the episode. So just giving a little bit of information about this person that I'm going to have today. This is one of the few people that is like my regular friend that's not a fire friend from the great city of Chicago. Um, she, she moved here by way through another state. We met each other um, around 2013, around Super Bowl time. And it was like in between our birthdays. Hers is in December, mine is in January. And I was at a small bar to watch the Super Bowl. Um, she said, if you come back for your birthday, I'll get you a drink. I took her up on that offer. I came back and she bought me a drink and us being BFFs, the rest is history. Um, she was, she started off as an usher in my wedding. Then she just was in the wedding. So that was pretty cool. She ran around and jumped on everybody. That was, that was fun as well. I'm not, I'm, I won't try and embarrass her too much, but hey that's what are friends for if not to embarrass you but we like i said this is one of my um friends that isn't a fire friend but she always like respects what i do and she talks to me about it we have conversations about all those subjects she's been to my house she's met my family she's just the best so getting to have her come on is very um it's a great occasion for me also when I've been talking about doing a podcast for a very long time. And she was the first person to kind of like, yeah, let's do it. And she, she like took notes and, and we made a name and we had a design. We had a bunch of stuff. We had an opening sound. We had a bunch of stuff. So um, I won't give away our name because I still own it. Well, I don't own it by myself. We own it together. And <laughs> we can always resurrect it. Maybe it'll become a segment on this show, depending on how it goes with um, people, how, you know, how this episode is received, which I'm sure will be good because she's fantastic. If anything, I'm going to have to try and keep, keep up with her. Her personality just explodes through the microphone, through the room, um, through television screens. I remember I was at work one day. I was watching WGN. And I hear this voice that sounds real familiar that's not one of the firemen I work with. And I look at the TV and it's her on there making cider cocktails. So that was pretty awesome as well. Um, we haven't had a chance to catch up in a long time. So this is going to be like a, a big catch-up episode. We haven't, we haven't seen each other in a while. Um, right now we're going through COVID. We have lockdowns and everything else. But getting this opportunity to talk with her is something that I've been looking forward to for a while. Like I said, we were, she was the first person that I was trying to have a podcast with. And we, like I said, we may bring that back up um, in the near future. But before I get into the episode proper, I have to um, real quick, well, I don't want to make it real quick, but I had a family member suddenly pass away yesterday while I was at work. Um, very unexpected, not COVID related or anything, but a death is a death and um, sad is sad and support is support. So a lot of people who, some of them listen to the show, some people know me, um, a lot of people reached out to me over social media, um, through text, through calls, through other family members just to say, hey, you know, that I'm sorry to hear that, sorry to see that. Um, very, very sad, very sudden, um, very tragic. And not just for me, but for her immediate family. She was a cousin to me, and we kind of started talking and got close over social media, actually. I mean, I would see her at um, family reunions, and we would hang out a little bit, but we really, like, bonded over Facebook and Instagram just like laughing each other's tweets and memes and DM each other um, I've watched her kids grow um, online and she did the same for me and we that was our major um, connection and intersection so so like I said for me it's, it's, it's sad but for her parents for her brother um, the rest of my cousins it's, it's really devastating to them so I 
can't have any type of platform or, or talk about anything else without thinking of that and without bringing up that um, issue and that subject. So just wanted to say thank you for the support. Um, but all the love and support really should go to her immediate family. Like I, like I said, she had small children, mom, dad, and it's really a blow for us. Um, so that's that's for that. Back to our regular episode. So again, I have my friend here, Ambrosia Borowski. I always say that wrong. It's hard. It's hard getting those out, but. Um, I'm going to let her introduce herself, and we're just going to have a catch-up conversation, and hopefully you guys enjoy this episode and like it, and let's go from there. Ambrosia, um, how are you? Um, I'm hanging in there. Hanging in there? Yeah. Okay. Condolences. Oh, thank you very yeah, much. Absolutely. It's tough. Yeah. No no fun, but hey, we, you know, we got to gotta keep moving, so... That's what that's what she would want. I'm, like I said, we she would send me messages all the time, so I'm sure that would be a uh, type of message that she would send me. So, yep, that was one of our sounds on the on the podcast. <laughs> so, tell us about yourself, Ambrosia. Uh, yeah. So my name is Ambrosia. I have been getting made fun of lately because I have probably the longest title. What, what, what's the longest title? Uh, so I'm the general manager and beverage director of the North Mean Beer and Cider Garden down on the Riverwalk. Oh my god, I was trying to write that down and I couldn't <laughs> even... I don't even think I could have got that shorthand. I'm the director of cider operations for the North Mean Club Cider. Oh, you're still going? Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you I'm learning. Gotta, gotta let you breathe. Go, go beverage ahead. Buy, um, beverage buyer for Fountainhead Market and Fountainhead. Okay. Uh, the founder of Chicago Cider Week. Okay. And the captain of Team BAMS, which is Bars Against MS. Bars Against MS. I haven't heard of that. Um, so many titles. Um, one more time. I won't interrupt you. Can you give me all those titles one more time? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the beverage director and general manager of the Northman Beer and Cider Garden. I'm the beverage buyer for Fountainhead Market and Fountainhead. Director of Cider Operations for the Northman Cider Company, the founder of Chicago Cider Week, and the captain of Team BAMS, which is Bars Against MS. Okay, so like I said, I wasn't going to interrupt you that time. I wanted you to get get everything out. <laughs> um, tell me about. So I, I gave a little brief description about how we met and where you came from. Like I said, I met you at a real small bar. And, excuse me. Your thing was to be like big from jump like I said you got me into taking notes real well and writing stuff down and effecting action and everything like that so kind of tell me where you started to where you're at now that you're a person who has all these titles um I, we used to argue over time who was um who was Jay-Z and who was Kanye I don't remember who was who but I don't, I don't know either. how you're feeling about that Kanye now yeah I don't I don't either mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I moved back to the city. I'm from Northwest Indiana, but I moved back in 2013. I was out in Toronto and Buffalo, New York. I opened a restaurant out there, and uh, I've always just been hungry. I think that's why we got along so well. Yep. Hustling and hungry. And when I came back, I wanted to jump two feet in. I wanted to get into the cider community here, and I actually dragged you along to my first cider event here. Yep. Uh, Navy Pier. Navy back when, Pier. Yeah, it was yep. Cider Summit. Uh, and it just just pushing ever since and just filling my days and and one of the things that we used to talk about is Beyonce has the same 24 hours that I do yep absolutely man you, yeah, you remember everything <laughs> <laughs> but this is right that's that's how we got to be so cool you just dropping those pop culture references that were so near and dear to my heart they still are but still are. um you talked about you talked about how we went to Navy Pier. We went to the cider show, um, and now, like you said, you're the founder of Cider Week. So let's let's get into that. Tell me about tell me more about Cider Summit, Cider Week, your love of cider. Let's 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 talk about that. So Chicago Cider Week happens in February, and it follows Chicago Cider or er, uh, Cider Con, 
which was a conference developed to still is still exists hopefully we can go there next year uh, but it used to be in Chicago every year. Mm -hmm. And so Cider Week would either end with CiderCon, and if CiderCon was in another city, it'd be two weeks after. And Cider Week always ends with um, Chicago Cider Summit. Okay. And uh, so I used to run the Northman that was up at Lincoln and Montrose, and we closed our doors in February, not because of COVID, that was before the US knew that it was gonna wreck us all, but uh, to put more focus into the cider company and so that I could move more into production. Uh, but I saw a need for the cider community here in Chicago and decided that no one else is doing it, so I'll just do it. So you saw a hole in the market and you filled it? Yeah. Okay. That's what that's what we love. That's that's exactly what we want to talk about. Um now you said the Northman was open and it closed in February. What did it close or did it turn into something else? Like what what give me a little bit more information about what's in the space now. Uh so we sold the building okay and most of the inventory uh took some of those gems with me some of that calvados and some of that cider with me but uh the place that's there now is called cobblestone oh okay i haven't been up there i haven't even been past so don't don't know so the northman now is just on the river walk mm -hmm. that's its only existence at this at this stage yeah and in our hearts and in our hearts okay uh, it was a outstanding great place up the cod was my favorite the um fish and chips yeah the fish and chips that cod was amazing um especially like fresh out the grease ah, super super good and it was like house made ketchup too mm -hmm. yeah that was awesome um another thing like i was reading through your bio that you gave me and it was talking about how you went from the back of the kitchen to the front can you tell me a little bit more about that transition? What did you do in the back of the kitchen? Now what do you do? Well, not at the kitchen anymore. Now you're just buying all the booze. But <laughs> it depends on how uh, short staff we are. Okay. I have definitely <laughs> been in the kitchen. Tell me about tell me about those experiences, please. Uh, so I started running around in the bakery when my dad was baking when I was very young. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to college and I studied linguistics and philosophy minors in French and Russian we can see how far liberal arts degrees will get you and so I was uh, working at like a little shop called Buffalo Louis in Bloomington Indiana I went to Indiana University mm -hmm. and um, I was at the counter and I hated dealing with customers and I hated having to sell stuff and I was like I don't really want to do this let me go into the back and there were no women back there but I was like no just let me go so they let me and I started cooking back there and learned how to be a short order cook and then I decided to go to culinary school shortly thereafter came back up to Chicago went to culinary school and then I moved out to Buffalo New York to open a restaurant out there and I was the executive chef and I did that for a while and, and then when I decided that I didn't want to do that anymore I, I went into baking uh, I baked for quite a while here in Chicago at a uh, Chicago Diner and uh, Bleeding Heart Bakery back when that existed because mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really want to deal with any of the meat. I've uh, been a long-term vegetarian and I really enjoyed the last episode you did about avoiding red meat. I <laughs> really appreciated the molar the molar explanation, the canine explanation. I was right there for that. I was shouting along with it. You, you was there for that? I was. I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still contemplating those those dietary changes but we can talk about it i know it's just one step at a time <laughs> one, one step at a time um so like you said you avoid the meat so that's one thing that is like for me is always like pretty sweet about you or like your convictions you're very like you if you say you want something you are on it for real and like the no meat thing we always talk about that and and Oh, I just just like the taste, the smell. And you're like, I don't do, but I ain't eating it. <laughs> he said, I'm I'm not with it. I'm, and and you like the the substitutes that you use are always so interesting to me. So um, give me give me like a few meat food substitutes that you do. Oh, and then I remember something else. You took me to my first Indian. Um, Peas and cheese. I had it last night. Yep, peas and cheese. Mud I had mutter paneer for those of you that are fluent in Indian cuisine. Not me. <laughs> peas and cheese. That's just what I called it. I had never, 
I had never been to a Indian restaurant before. Um, that one time you went, well, we went a couple times, but you invited me that time and you said, yeah, it's good. It's, it's, it's a lot of, um, Indian food is good to be vegetarian because of the flavors and all the different, you know, spices and everything you using. You were dead on. I had a meatless meal and I was full and satisfied. You know, I cooked for, uh, so I decided to get out of the back of the house because one, there's no money. Cooks don't make anything. Chefs don't make anything. That's a, that's a fallacy. Unless you own like six or seven restaurants and you know, have all of your stuff in, in Jewel and Mariana's, you're not going to make any money off of it. So I switched to the front of the house via wine because I had a lot of wine training in uh, culinary school. Uh, but I still like to cook and I still can jump in and I think it's made me a better, well-rounded general manager to be able to see the front of the house and back of the house are the same same team but I had a bunch of my my French friends over a lot of French friends a lot of French friends like from France French friends yes. okay yeah, yeah people make fun of me all the time because I, I typically have more French people around me than I do Americans but I made them a three-course meal and it was all vegetarian and a lot of them are super skeptical because the French love their their dairy and their bread and I'm celiac so I can't I can't have any of the bread or anything like that mm -hmm. and I uh, did a three course and they were blown away that you could actually eat a full meal be satiated and not have any meat right that's it's, that's me psychological yeah uh, I don't know if it's all psychological we can argue about that later but <laughs> but that that's that's awesome and and another thing that I always appreciated about you and your cooking abilities is even though you don't eat meat or even drink beer because I remember when I was a big beer drinker um, not anymore but when I was you even knew about like what would be good and what what like how to make stuff even though you didn't eat it and you still could describe stuff because I always thought that was funny when people would say what does this taste like and you say well it tastes like this, it tastes like that, it tastes like the other, it goes with this, and, and they would get it, and they're like, oh yeah, this is great. So is that like a mind trick, or did you really know what you were talking about? Uh, see, it, it's not a mind trick. It's it actually, <laughs> um, flavor is actually 95% aromatics. Okay. You don't really need to taste something in order to know what's going on. Okay. I, I haven't had a lot of stuff. I've never had salmon before. I've never had shrimp before. I've never had, it. you name it, I probably haven't had it. Uh, and with a just a good sense of smell, you can tell what's going on. Uh, there's some things that you can't get from your sense of smell, like acid content. Uh, but if you know the style of the beer and you've read the book on it, then you can pretty much figure it out. Okay, so read the book on it. That that makes me think of something else. Um, you're an author as well, so about reading the book. How about reading your book? Tell tell us about your book. Uh, well, <clears throat> my book is nothing like your book. Your book is, is an actual, like, full published book, and well done on that. Thank you very much. Uh, mine is a, I, the one that I have is a, it's a tasting book. Uh, okay. And so it's like the one that you bought me at the Cider Summit. Mm -hmm. uh, way back in the day, 33 books, I had no idea who it was. It's this one guy, Dave, he's awesome. And he prints them all in his uh, printing studio in Portland, Oregon. And uh, Seb bought me one of those books, and I was enamored with it and I used it all the time and then I met Dave at I think it was the Northman or a cider con or one of the many cider things that we go to throughout the years and um, he was talking about rum and I was like hey I can teach you about rum give me 10 minutes I can teach you everything you need to know about rum and so I sat him down lined up some rums gave him the elevator course on it and when he came out with the tasting book for rum he asked me to help him collaborate on it and oh, write it for him that's awesome so he didn't have a knowledge of rum prior to, well, like a vast knowledge of rum prior to meeting you? Uh, yeah, outside of like drinking it, you didn't know like the technical parts or the categories or how, how we compartmentalize and, and deal with rum as a category, yeah. Can you give me a few? Uh, so you've got three basic types of how we talk about rum with distillation. You have, and it's, it's really... Rum is depressing. Are you sure we want to go down the room? I absolutely do. We uh, just, I'm sorry, not to take you off track, but um, down in the depths of somewhere, I still have our rum, um, our rum recording. Oh, yeah. Sailor Jerry. Sailor Jerry. I have our Malort. 
recording. Mm -hmm. And there's one more that I have. Uh, Sailor Jerry Malort. There was one more that we did. Yeah, we'll come to it. Okay, keep going. I'm sorry. So tell us about the run. Oh, that's good. So uh, we categorize them by how they were colonized, how the islands were colonized in the Caribbean. Okay. And uh, so you talk about French distillation, um, you talk about English distillation, and then Latin distillation. Mm -hmm. And so the biggest difference is going to be with French, you're using more raw sugar cane because Napoleon was using beet sugar during World War One in order to uh, use his energy. So he had a lot of extra sugar cane left over. And so you get something called agricole, which is more funky. Uh, and uh, comes from the straight sugar cane, whereas you look at the English side, you're looking at Jamaica, Jamaican rums, I know you know about Jamaica. Absolutely. Uh, you've got a thing called Dunder, <laughs> and uh, it's more, it's a dark, heavy, different type of funk. And then you have the, uh, the Latin, which would be uh, more of your hybrid stills, more of your um, balanced type of flavor profile. Okay. Now there's, these are just categories that uh, one association has put out. I'm extremely excited to see how this is going to change. I just listened to or participated in, uh, I didn't participate, I, I watched a um, uh, uh, radical exchange program that they had uh, about a full day of panels that was put on by Ashton Berry of, of uh, people of every color, well, except white, and different categories. And the rum category was absolutely fascinating. It taught me about how tiki shouldn't really be called tiki. You should probably be calling it tropical and bringing in Tiki like a um, like a tiki torch or like, like what what is drinks. tiki? Oh, like tiki drinks. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's mm -hmm. I don't usually drink. Well, I, that's what we talked about on our episode. I, rum is not my favorite, but yeah. <laughs> keep but, going. But uh, they t they had a full plan a uh, full panel of of people from all different backgrounds and and talking about what's really going on in the Caribbean and and who's making these products and who actually made them to begin with and who owns them and the disparity that comes along with that and the later that week I, on Twitter the BBC uh, Australia but it did a whole thing about how the rum category is up and coming and this is the this is the company that's gonna do it and it was a bunch of white dudes from Australia <laughs> I tweeted back but they didn't hear it but I was like is this really gonna be the representation of what the Caribbean is going to be like is this really where we're headed with this like why aren't we listening to the people that are actually in the Caribbean the people that actually make it right and so rum history has got a long way to go uh, but it is a fascinating category yes it is it's it's very diverse and gets into a lot of areas and that's like with alcohol, I I stopped. Well, I don't want to say I stopped. I have a drink every now and then, but for the most part, I don't drink that often. I'm just I just Good I just don't need more. And I want to get into that with you a little more later. Um, but as far as like the complexities of drinking, I remember talking to different people about drinking, um, and they're like, oh, people just drinking a drink or drinking a how it makes them feel. I'm like, ah. I mean, you can actually taste. Like, I had one buddy. He was a um, bartender, and he like had the most developed palate ever. He could taste every note, every hint of everything. And I just remember like some of the people I was talking to kind of making fun of that. Like, they're just talking. They're good with words. <laughs> but I feel like you can actually taste taste different stuff in different types of drinks. It's just Everything in moderation, even moderation, you just can't go overboard board with it. And, then, and that's a serious problem in our industry, uh, mental health, and, and something that we're all kind of banding together to do, especially right now during COVID and, and how our industry is being hit by this. Uh, it's, it's really intense, and the government is definitely not going to be giving us a bailout anytime soon because we're not Wall Street, but it is going to close over half of the bars and restaurants in the city of Chicago, and it already has. So we're, we're all kind of reaching out to each other about mental health, but as far as tasting and evaluating goes, I, I travel all over the world to do tasting and evaluating. And I guarantee you it's not stuff that we make up. And there are some, do you have an explicit? Yes, I have the E. Great. There are some bullshit things that people say, and I hear them all the time. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, this smells like the wet dew on a warm summer day just after sunrise. I'm like, eh, shut up. <laughs> like, that is kind of bullshit but if you if you have something like this calvados that we have right here mm -hmm. 
that smells like, I would say, red apple skin. I can smell an orchard floor. Now, why would it be a uh, hold, hold on? What is an orchard floor like? An orchard like an apple orchard, just an like apple orchard. After I would, when you say orchard floor, like you do have to specify if it was spring or fall. But if it's in the fall, you're gonna have manure. You're gonna have well, that's more in the spring. You'll have uh, uh, like rotting leaves. You'll have the grass. You'll have the the dirt. You'll have all of these sensory things and. And sensory is no lie, and, and some people don't have a good sense of smell, and I understand that. But sometimes you do have a good sense of smell, and it can transform you. I was tasting out a, a manzanilla uh, sherry cause for, for buying for the market, and I put my nose in that glass, and I immediately was on a patio in Toronto in the middle of the day with nothing else left to do except eat cheese and drink the sherry, and it just hit me. And you, you know that. You can smell something and you'd be like, oh my god, I'm back in my grandma's basement. Yeah. And there is something about the sensory appeal to alcohol specifically because there are two things that deliver aromatics, right? Sugar content and alcohol content. So the higher the alcohol content or and carbonation also can deliver, uh, it'll, it'll come up in your face and, and you can have this visceral moment when you're still stuck in the same spot like we all have been since March. You can actually <laughs> go somewhere else with just the just the smell of it. That's awesome. Well, I think you just gave people tips on how to take mind vacations. Just get a bottle, open it up, and smell it, and reminisce. Take you take you back to a different era. But I mean that 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 goes like you said. That goes. We we talked about food, um, booze. I have a former officer. He's since retired. And I guess I can say it because he's retired, but this dude is like the weed king. And every time he would come around, he'd say, here, smell this. Oh, it smells great. Here, smell this. Oh, and just, and he, and, and that's another aromatic type of thing that like gets people going. So mm -hmm. that's, that's very, that's, those are always interesting issues to me, how people can pick up on those things. So you said the orchard floor. I have never heard, any, and then you said manure. Mm -hmm. Man manure is poop, so you want to yeah. smell... Yeah, cow shit. Actually, we debate a lot in cider about the difference between cow shit, sheep shit, and horse shit. Uh, they all smell different. They all smell very different. Uh, I prefer... If, I'm more of a cow shit. If you say so. But I have a buddy who likes sheep shit in, in cider, and that would be Easy Orchards. It's all over sheep shit, but I prefer the English stuff. It's more of okay. cow shit. I remember that rem reminds me. I was in um, South Africa and when I was there. We went on a safari, and the uh, um, what's the person that takes you out on safari? The safari. safariist, safari. safarier, safari guy. The gentleman that was running the safari was like he picked up a um, rhino pie, a poop, and he was like, "Here, you can eat it." He offered it to me. You want to eat it? I'm like, ah, that's okay. No, thank you. He said, watch this. And then he ate it. <laughs> he was like, all they do is just eat grass and comes out. It doesn't stop anywhere. It doesn't do anything. It's really just like eating grass all over again. Sure. And I said, mm -hmm. whatever you say, sir, that's good for you. And you know what? That was another episode we were supposed to do. We were supposed to do South African wines. Yep, Pinotage. Yep, but we didn't. I actually just picked up there. a, I should, I need to bring you some of that. I just picked up this awesome uh, red blend. Uh, it's a can, and what these guys did was they noticed that the people picking the grapes in, in the vineyards are black and poor and have to travel in to do lots of manual labor, and the people that own the wineries are rich and white. And what they do is they donate 50% of the profits every year to a foundation that will try and help equal that out. Okay. And there's so many problems in the alcohol industry and, the, and just the consumer industry that we all got to start finding solutions to. Yeah, I um, was reading a book and they were talking about, um, the book was talking about how capitalism is tied to slavery and it's like no way around it. And not just, not just um, African American, or not even African American, African slavery, just slavery, period like any form of capital but that's that's a different conversation for a different show we, we that's what rum was rum, rum was slavery that's, that's how it got around i'll try it was and on the slave trade stay on topic
Because, yeah, we can we can go off on all different kinds of ways. Because, like, like I was talking about, the Malort episode, we talked about how um, Malort started and where it came from, the Wormwood. Um, I have the, the person that was just on my last podcast, um, Vinny, he, like, has a box, and he just, like, opens it up at work and like steam comes out and he has all these different little concoctions and wormwood was one of them so that's like kind of your initiation to the academy is here take this take this shot of wormwood and i took it and i was like oh it tastes like malort like malort what's that i said oh it's a it's a booze this is chicago booze and he's from um detroit and of course me i'm from out of town as well but when I got to Chicago, people were like, here, drink this, drink this nasty drink, and that'll make you one of us. And I drink, and I said, it's not that bad. And they said, what? What's wrong with you? Like, you could go bars and buy it for, like, you could buy Malort and a bottom of the barrel beer. Like, what beer would they give you? Uh, it's like, usually old style and a shot of Malort. Yes. It's called the Chicago Handshake. Yes, yes, yes. That's exactly what... Right, I would go out and that's what people would offer me. And I'm like, oh, this is pretty good. And they would like look at me like I was crazy because they were like trying to, who gives somebody a, a handshake this, like with a with a wet hand? <laughs> that's, or who, you know, who tries to squeeze your hand off as they're giving you a handshake. So I don't know why it's called a Chicago handshake, but. Uh, old style is Chicago beer. My dad drank old style. And Malort is, uh, I mean, it's controversial, of course. But it's back in the city and. We don't need to get me off a tangent on Mormon because you know I make my own lore. You know I'll get off on a tangent. Uh, yeah, we had that's Jepson, and they had moved to Florida. Then it came back. Um, well done. And then Besk. Uh huh. Leatherby. Leatherby. Yep. That's mm -hmm. Leatherby is Besk, right? Uh, Leatherby makes Besk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It has the blue. That one's pretty. That one's like sweeter. Mm -hmm. So we like tried all the Malorts. Mm -hmm. That's a bartender. More of a bartender one. Okay. And then I remember I saw it on the shelf one day and I asked for it and they like thought I was in the industry. I'm like, no, I just <laughs> want to try it. I just, I just got a friend. I got a buddy that. Your honorary, honorary industry. Tells me about that, about this stuff. Um, so like so many different things I want to ask you about. So real quick, you talked about um, mental health. I remember I saw. I don't know how I saw it. I don't think you sent it to me. I think I was just um, deep diving rabbit hole in the internet and I saw a video with you and another person in front of a bar talking about um, drinking and how not to drink and when to drink and um, yeah, like I said with my wake. issues. Wide yeah. Wake 52. Tell it's me like, about that please. My buddy Tony, we're actually uh, doing a big old bike ride on Monday, uh, ride bikes with him, but he decided to do a project where he didn't drink for 52 weeks, uh, so a year, uh, to see how he felt. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, interviewed everybody, like uh, a podcast or a uh, video cast, I guess you would. For like every a vlog. Week. Yeah, vlog. Here yep. you are. Um, about what you do outside of drinking and, and how we take care of ourselves and, and what that means for us. And we talked a lot about uh, physical activity with mine, but he's interviewed 52 people now and he's still not drinking. He drinks very occasionally, but he just decided it really wasn't for him after being an Irish guy that, you know, binge drank for how many years? So he went past the 52 weeks? He's still mm -hmm. going? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He has the occasional cider, uh, but for the most part, he's, he just kind of gave it up. It is uh, it is a poison. It's a toxin. It's it's not for everybody, and, and some people have the tendency to abuse it, and being self-aware is something that's hard to do when you're under the influence all the time. Right. That's, that's yep, kind of, I'm sitting in his boat. So... You know, if you wouldn't mind, you could give me his information. Um, maybe I can reach out to him and see if I can see if I can trick him into coming on too. Because that's all I'm doing now is just oh, tricking, love to. tricking people into coming on this. Yeah, <laughs> coming yeah, we'll on my Tony podcast. We'll definitely get Tony in here. But yeah, that's 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 definitely something I'd like to talk to somebody and explore explore a little bit more of. Because that's kind of how I started on my whole like I finally I had been writing on that book for a while got it done um working on another book now and i'm rounding the corner on it finally got this going um and you know cutting some things out and cutting back on some other things and increasing other areas of my life definitely helped contribute to some of the successes i've had lately yeah so, it's all about balance yep it's all about balance and I, I remember i was talking to a buddy of mine and um he was telling me about how 
I was telling him about another friend who like loves barbecuing. He like has the biggest barbecue trailer. Um, it's like as big as a small apartment, and he just barbecue bar. He like, man, why, why, how he get so far into it? I'm like, the same way you get so far into stuff. I guess all my friends just get so far into stuff. It's like the people I hang around with, they are go hard or go home. They, so trying to find moderation and, and balance is difficult. So, like I said, that's kind of where this whole thing grew out of trying to help people balance at least that's trying to help myself balance so try and help somebody else at the same time yeah, when you lead people will follow we will see that's what, <laughs> that's what i'm still trying to do um so as far as uh, another uh, awesome thing that i wanted to bring up about you and i kind of um glanced past it when i was talking about your cooking and how how good that you do cook you made for my wife and I, the best wedding cake I have ever had, ever. Like, I thought wedding cake was just supposed to be, it's here, just eat this cake, that, you know, it is what it is. But you made this cake that was like actually good. So can you, just, the, you don't have to give me all the secrets, just how did that happen? So are you talking about your wedding cake or were you talking about your wife's cupcakes. The wedding cake. Because <laughs> I had nothing to do with her cupcakes, but that's what she wanted, and the bride's always right. Um, I don't even remember. Ta oh, I do remember the cupcakes. Mm -hmm. You made those too? Oh, those were yellow cake box box cake. Oh, that, well, that's what she likes. That's what she likes. Yeah, she she'll tell you that. Yeah. That's what she likes. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's see, that's that, yeah, that's what she likes. But I'm no, I'm talking about the cake cake. Cake cake. Uh, so the key to a good cake is one: don't over bake it. Okay. Uh, so what you're dealing with with baking in general is it's a big chemistry equation. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with fat, you're dealing with heat, uh, you're dealing with well, gluten in the case of yours, and you have to really get the the balance right of when the gluten and the steam come into play as well as the fat and uh, yeah, dried out cakes are gross. And then also what people do a lot of times with wedding cakes by the way, friends don't let friends pay for wedding cakes. Oh, man. Crap the shit. <laughs> I know how much it costs to make a wedding cake. It doesn't cost that much. And, uh, but it's, you know, it's the bread and butter. But the thing that a lot of people do with wedding cakes is they add a ton of gluten to them and they overbake them in order for the structure to really hold so that they can make them big and tower. And as long as you don't have a reckless driver taking your cake to the wedding venue, uh, they'll stay pretty pretty upright as long as they've had time to cool down properly and as long as they've had time to really set. So you just, it's just you can't rush it. That's the thing with with cake. You just can't rush it. I don't even know how it got there. Did you did you bring it there? I I don't I I, I had a lot going on that day. So that, you brought it there. Okay. Well, I must have <laughs> drove great then because it it tasted fantastic. <laughs> there was there was a lot of Beyonce involved. Yes, mm -hmm. that like I said, that was that was that was a great day. That was a great day. That was a great day. We none of us learned how to tie a bow tie, but it was still a great day. Yes, it, yes, <laughs> it, it it was it was outstanding. No, that I, I wish we would have videoed it. Uh, we, we got pictures and memories. That's, I'm so glad it was not videoed. Well, this is so. <laughs> just you know, you gotta gotta video in our mind. One day, like on Black Mirror, we'd be able to like plug in something to our mind and then just play it all out, and then it'd be it'd be all good. So, um, so you you hit every every issue that I wanted to. You gave us who you are. Um, the major thing you told us, like you just gave us a tip of the iceberg of your vast knowledge of things that taste. I won't, I won't say good all the time, but things that taste interesting, and you like have a, a really good understanding and grasp of it. How did you get that grasp? Like, how did you, how did, how did you get so good at identifying everything, learning taste, learning cooking, just that creative space there? I think it really comes from curiosity. I think that the first time, I, the reason I got into the service industry is because I really like service. I really truly enjoy creating an environment for people to have a good time, to enjoy themselves, but to also 
be able to engage with each other on an equal playing field. And that's always been super important to me. But I think the first time that I got that spark of things taste a certain way and uh, you can combine them and, and not was, uh, it was wine class in culinary school. Mm-hmm. I was um, I was going out for a cigarette and my wine professor, who is a, a psalm, was like, hey, you smoke cigarettes? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, all right take this and it was a Dunhill uh, no it wasn't I forget what it was but it was like a green tea cigarette and he handed it to me and he goes don't go downstairs think about the wine that we just had and think about that cigarette and think about how they would pair together and I went outside and I smoked that cigarette and it blew my mind that you could think about tobacco and wine and the tobacco notes in the wine and how they would combine and it it just got me so intrigued that from that day on, I just started digging. What flavor combinations are there? Why do things smell the way that they do? Why do they taste the way that they do? And so when I'm tasting something or I'm evaluating, I have this long list of things that I go through. And this is a lot with, with tasters. Is first, I run through all the fruit categories in my head. Am mm-hmm. I getting any of these fruit categories? Am I getting berries? Am I getting stone fruit? Am I getting orchard fruit? Am I getting uh, tropical fruit? And then if I am, which ones? Are they ripe? Or are they not? Which variety of them? And then I go through all the rest of the checking of the boxes. After fruit, you get things like herbs uh, and greenery, so like tomato vines. Or uh, then you can go into the natural part, like bark, mineral, whetstone, concrete, slate. Going into that, then you go into your uh, tobacco notes. Uh, you can go into um, things like your funk, like uh, manure. Hey. <laughs> It, it came up before. Let's keep let's keep bringing it up. <laughs> Dried hay, uh, marijuana, um, like retsina, which is a, a Greek wine that, that uses uh, sap on top of it to preserve it. It's got a lot of marijuana characteristics to it, or like a Sauvignon Blanc that can have a lot of marijuana characteristics to it, even though it's not that. Uh, and so you just run through this checklist, mental checklist that you have, and and you, the more that you know how to recognize these things, the more you want to smell. I, I remember there was a, a place under construction right near my house. And I walked past it and I wanted to walk inside because I wanted to smell some of the different construction smells that they were doing, like <laughs> freshly cut wood and fresh concrete. I know, and I would have been a total creep and I didn't do it, but I just wanted to be like, can I sniff your construction site? Because it's really gonna help me with my you, sensory you analysis. You have to be very careful where you where you participate and do in those type of activities. <laughs> so That's true. all I'm gonna say. I was cycling through Ileana and Wolf Lake and uh, I, I, there's like a stagnant pool of water in the grass, like the, the big grass. I stopped and I was like, I've smelled that before. Where have I smelled that? But like now I know I can say that. A, a stagnant, marshy pond would be a tasting note that I would be able to work on identifying with some sort of fermentation. Okay. Well, speaking of tasting notes, what is the weirdest tasting note that you've ever heard not that you can think of because i think we had an episode about trying to make up stuff and you're like yeah just keep going just keep going just keep going but what 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 is one of the weirder ones that you've heard somebody put on a on an evaluation sheet a judge uh uh glick cap it's the largest center competition in the world and somebody put that it smelled like rhino farts okay and i was like when did you win when did you smell a rhino fart? They might have. They bought, They might have been on that safari <laughs> with me. When have you smelled a rhino fart? Another <laughs> one I got. Uh, it was. Uh, it smells like somebody took a burnt piece of cheesy garlic bread and was eating it in the middle of the cleaning product section of a Walmart. I love that one. And it was bang on. That's I, exactly I, I, what it smelled. That's like. what it smelled like. Yeah. <laughs> So that sounded like a riot, uh, <laughs> a, a riot time where it they was like bad. it didn't it didn't metal. It was really bad. Taste. They they went and plugged in the microwave or plugged in a toaster oven from aisle seven. Then they went to aisle eighteen, got the garlic bread, then they put it in there, let it burn, and then they went in bleach and clean the supplies and just poured everything on the floor and ate it. Fabuloso, Febreze, it was all there. All there. Mm-mm. It was so gross. I, another thing, do you know that the CDC and the internet has been teaching us how to make chloroform. Like, if you look at some of these things, they like, if you mix bleach and rubbing alcohol, it makes this. Or if you mix 
um, bleach and ammonia and makes that. Well, no, they have to. They have to teach us about cleaning products. But yeah, now they're telling you how to make the cleaning products that'll go mess somebody up. They're but telling, <laughs> but they're, I think the point is, don't mix these chemicals and please don't put them in your body. That, that's in the maybe book. That might be... I got a page, a page of that is in the book. <laughs> a lot of stuff is in the book. If you if you haven't checked it out, please check out that book, Department 3C Presents Canada's Guide to a Long, Strong, Healthy Career by Severin Henderson. Um, gotta, gotta plug it. Um, it was one other thing. Now I went off on that tangent. Now I forgot what I was going to ask you. That's what always happens. But that's okay. Um, thank you very much. Is there any other subjects topics anything that you want to hit anything that you want to talk about before we get out of here i'm in the tavern okay the tavern's how we met can we talk about which tavern it was millie's, should we millie's is gone yeah millie's is gone mm -hmm. millie's was awesome and i used to live like right around the corner so i used to walk there in fact my buddy my buddy um max the one that introduced me to it and i took it over as mine um Guys took me to an extra cider summit. Um, we used to have a little pool table in there. I used to watch like all the games in there. Mm -hmm. It was a good corner tavern, a Chicago tavern, and you saw today. Lightfoot said that uh, they're closing down as of Friday. Any tavern that does not serve food is down. Oh, it that's is. what it is. I yeah. thought it was just no indoor alcohol sales, just yeah. outdoor. Oh, that's the beginning. It's the beginning. That's going to happen anytime soon. Okay. And we're just waiting for it to happen, but uh, I mean, the tavern is the spot. And I, I wrote a piece for uh, a cider magazine called Malice, just about this, about about gender and and the tavern and how when you sit down next to each other in a bar stool, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what's in your glass. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter if you're a fireman or you're a cop or you are a football player or you are a professor it doesn't matter when you're sitting down at the tavern together and you're all enjoying whatever you want to drink and you should drink whatever you want to drink i don't care if it's a martini or if it's a, a pink sweet drink or if it's just a straight dram of whiskey i don't care you're all sitting there and if it's a good tavern you can all have a conversation about anything and they say don't talk about religion and politics in a bar. Well, I don't really believe in that. If you have a good bartender, you can do that safely and navigate it. Yeah. And that's something that the Northman was. We have been there before with people. Oh yeah. Yeah, we oh, used to. Oh yeah. Yeah, we used to. We used to go there with people all the time. But if you're if you have a good bartender and it's being facilitated and it's a it's an inclusive space, and everyone feels safe to do it, then why not? I mean, some of our greatest ideas. The, the revolution, which, you know, is kind of half-sided, but a good idea at the time. <laughs> and, uh, it, it all took place in the tavern. And bringing people together, and for me, as a buyer, making drinks of, of any sort accessible to anybody is super important. And um, I just really am sad to see the tavern st struggling right now, and, and the tavern's closing, and... I don't know. I don't know what the structure of the bar is going to look like in the next year. None of us know. None of us know what's even going to happen next month. But yeah. the tavern has always held something very special in my heart as as a way for people to bond together and and have that other family. Not all of us have families at home, and to be able to to walk into a bar and have that family has been something that's been very important to my life. You sound like Cheers. It's cheers. <laughs> I mean that that's that's exactly what you described it like. I um that show it wasn't my favorite and I was of course young when it was coming on, but I'm like, man, these people are always in there. They just they just drunk. <laughs> and, and they you know, I mean it was written, it was scripted Maybe or Norm, whatever. But, but it, it no, doesn't hold up. I, I yeah. watched it recently, it doesn't really hold up. Well, yeah, it might be yeah. but I'm I'm just talking about the concept, the, the going idea. The, exactly the idea of going and hanging out. You know, I didn't got into plenty of arguments with people about issues, and even when you like had to text me, like, "Oh, I'm so sorry that person said that to you." I'm like, you, how are you gonna speak for them? <laughs> that's that's the hey, that they're just making sure everybody feels welcome. That's that's the point of the bartender. Yes, it's hard to it's hard to put me out as far as that kind of stuff goes, especially from somebody I don't even know that I just met, <laughs> like in East couple of hours right here but like you said we spent a lot of good times in there um 
Sober bars. That's like a, a new big trend. Coffee We're shop? Still making. See, I don't like coffee that much. I mean. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> what are you talking about a sober bar? You're not, well, not no, a coffee shop. Too. Well, no, no, no. It's an actual thing where they have like sober bars where they're making, they make designer cocktails, but not with alcohol. So mm -hmm. like all the juices, um, tiki drinks, like you were saying, little umbrellas, um, make them the same way. They just make them um, without alcohol. Like, what was that one? I, I told you about that one bar where they made the drink with the egg whites. Mm -hmm. And the egg, the egg white and the um, rosemary. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, they make stuff like that. But Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of companies coming out with uh, alcohol-free spirits as well. Okay. See? So that's that's what I'm talking about. Sober bar. Yeah. Tony, uh, Tony actually works with that more uh, to do the uh, alcohol-free cocktails. I, it's it's hard to mimic spirits and mocktails. Mo uh, yeah, it's isn't that what they're called or the, not? Now they're that used to be what they're called. Now they're because it, it's become a more serious movement and okay. to erase the stigma of if you're not drinking, you're doing it wrong, mm -hmm. which I've always thought was bullshit. If somebody doesn't want to drink, don't make them drink. Don't force it on someone. If somebody doesn't want to take a shot, don't take a shot. Oh yeah, it's We've your been body. Super shot culture. Oh, it's that is a Chicago thing, and I've traveled all over the world and as soon as i say shots everyone's like oh you're from chicago yeah <laughs> it's like, uh no yeah we always have that shots to gator that's in the crowd shots to gator i like that i am not a shots to gator but i'm writing that down i have a lot of friends that are like the other day one of my buddies were coming he was coming out and i was like oh he's on his way shots to gator <laughs> get ready but um now it's not so much mocktail as it is more of a non-alcoholic and a lot of times, and, and Tony can speak to this more actually, of putting that cocktail on the menu in the cocktail section and not even denoting that it's not alcoholic. Mm -hmm. So that that way, if somebody doesn't want to have alcohol and they feel uncomfortable about it, that they could be included into the conversation and sit down next to that person and have a cocktail made for them. And uh, if somebody is uh, pregnant and they can't drink, but they don't want to tell people they're pregnant because it's too early. Right. You could be served a cocktail just in the same way. Uh, so, I, you know, I think sober bars are, are a good thing. I just hope that someday we can get to the point where we can integrate non-drinkers and drinkers in the same space. Well, I think we can. Um, the, the peer pressure, I, I appreciate what you're saying there, like kind of, hey, drink, 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 drink. But, you know, if you kind of have like a strong wheel, like, hey, I'm not on it, and that's what you're standing on, that's fine. Because... That's one of the major things that, like even COVID, I just miss hanging out and talking to people, talking to strangers about strange things, like people I've never met before. And that's just, that's interesting to me. Just, and I don't want to say pick their brain because then that denotes that I'm trying to take something from them. I just like talking to just random people. Having, having a tavern experience. That's right, having a tavern experience. It doesn't have to always involve alcohol but I remember I, I, I said I forgot what I was gonna say I remember what I was gonna say you were talking about service and how you liked service and you like and that's probably another one of our connected things because yeah, as, remember when you tried to convince me to be a fireman yes I, I did I did try to convince you to be I'm like you should just you go to school you do this you do that oh you'd be great in the fire out and then and then sometimes we would have arm wrestling contests and pull-up contests and push-up contests mm -hmm. I've gotten better at my push-ups, by the way. Still not good enough to beat me, though. Let's try. Or or an arm wrestling <laughs> contest. I'm 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 pot. If I lose to you in an arm wrestling contest, I don't know what I do. I will challenge accepted. Vote for Donald Trump. So I won't you, lose. You are the Kanye. <laughs> Oh, uh, it's just it's just jokes. But service is like what what connect was another thing that I think like connects us because that's what first responders and fire like if you're really into it, you really are trying to serve and help people around you. I mean, it's it's a life of service, and yours is just a different type of service, alcohol service. So I'm with that. Mm -hmm. I'm food service as well because you are really really good at what you do. And like I said, you gave us a lot of information and in a little bit of time you're just phenomenal and you have got to come back um i'm gonna go find those old episodes maybe i'll make them bonus episodes or something or maybe maybe later on down the line we can like do a segment or something to like a, well i said that at the beginning we can do a segment to the show um just kind of talking about 
what you bring. Speaking of that, before I let you go, is there any thing about anything? I was thinking like um, booze in particular, since that's your industry. But is there um, anything that you would like us to know about? Anything special you can tell us about? Something secret, not secret, but something on the low that you want to promote to anybody, like booze-wise? I mean, Calvados. Okay, talk about it. Uh, so everyone knows that I fucks with fruit, brandy. I drink a lot of Hennessy. I drink a lot of cognac. I drink a lot of Armagnac, and people tend to know those more often. Uh, but the little known spirit that I have been obsessed with is Calvados. It's it's apple brandy from Normandy, which is at the north of France, where uh, D Day happened. That's what they're most known for. Their major export is actually dairy. Um, so they have the uh, uh, Camembert, Huelavac, uh, all those French cheeses that they're coming out of, of Normandy. Uh, but the cows that make those cheeses are actually eating the apples that are spent from the distillation. But Calvados is a spirit that really captures the eau de vie, the life of the fruit that it's distilling. Mm -hmm. And it does this over a long period of time. And there's so much in Calvados history and Calvados culture and so many different flavors that you can get and so many ways to make cocktails with it. It's such an exciting product. And nobody even knows how to pronounce it. Really well, you, you're you pushing us in a direction to know what you're talking about. So I appreciate that. Um, is there anything you want to plug? you want anybody to find you anywhere? Um, you want to plug the rum book? You know, many social medias? I know you're doing trivia. You want to? Yeah, so I do trivia with uh, Kite String Cantina. It's an awesome bar, taquitos. And uh, they have like a little market set up. So now you can like go in and get your eggs from local farmers and a couple of other things to support the local farmers uh, in their space up on the north side. Uh, and then I'm a Mead of Gods is my Instagram handle and my Twitter handle. Mead, um, as in Ambrosia, of the you know, food of the gods. I'm with it. Uh, yeah, Mead of the Gods. And um, you can follow me there and catch all the different things that I'm doing. I, I do a lot of panels and um, a lot of webinars and, and education types of stuff so you're everywhere I think, that's a, I think that's the best place to catch me you're everywhere and then we're definitely gonna have to have you come back i'm sure you i'm, I'm sure it. you will you my buddy so thank you for coming on um thank you. you thank you thank you for having me thank you, you for inviting me hey you are very welcome um if you want to reach out to me remember it's department 3c everywhere um department 3c on twitter instagram facebook um, and I am Sebi at the same places. I A M S E V Y. That's just personal stuff. You see a lot of my kids and family, but <laughs> so cute. And Department Three C is the podcast, book, consultant, coaching, all of that big fun stuff platform. So, thanks for listening to another episode, and we will catch you next time. Bye.